Where is he? There. <laughs> All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so my talk focuses on conceptualizing attitudes and related social psychological constructs as networks. And uh, the reason why I think that uh, networks are a very promising framework for social psychological constructs is that um, social psychology is a very complex science. So uh, it's, it's without any doubt that um, uh, the human mind is one of the most complex uh, dynamical systems uh, in the universe. And uh, in social psychology, we are not only concerned with uh, analyzing these, uh, these extremely complex systems in isolation, but we also uh, are interested in how these very uh, complex systems interact, uh, perceive each other, and also represent each other. And so I think this uh, makes social psychology uh, a good candidate uh, to be the most complex science of all, actually. And uh, network theory and analysis uh, has been shown to, to be uh, very able to, to deal uh, with uh, complex systems, and it's also re reflected in uh, the fact that it is probably the most uh, interdisciplinary field today. To date, it has uh, spurred um, de 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 uh, developments in understanding uh, complex systems in physics, in, bio, in biology, uh, in sociology. Of course, there are networks ideas also in, uh, in, in social psychology for, for some time, uh, like, like uh, semantic networks. Um, but however, really estimating networks from psychological data was only uh, recently introduced. And uh, it was introduced in clinical psychology, and um, the basic idea of these empirical network models uh, is that, um, that we can uh, conceptualize observable variables like symptoms of a disorder, uh, personality characteristics, or, for example, also uh, beliefs toward a given attitude object as nodes within a network. And that relations between these different uh, observable variables that belong to the same construct um, result from direct causal connection between these different, um, these different uh, observable variables. So, uh, for example, that um, the three symptoms of depression are related because, for example, three symptoms of depression like as insomnia, irritability, and, uh, and uh, sorry, I'm uh, insomnia, fatigue, and irritability are related because they are share direct causal connections. So that, for example, insomnia causes fatigue, and in this in turn causes then irritability, and that through such direct causal connections, uh, the constructs as we know them emerge. And um, so the, the direct uh, causal connection between these variables are then represented as edges. And based on this basic idea, in recent years, uh, several methods were de developed to um, estimate uh, networks from psychological data. And um, let us, uh, and I want to briefly illustrate this, and let us assume we have measured four uh, observable variables like um, beliefs toward a given attitude object and um, we, we are interested in the underlying network. And of course, uh, we don't really know what the true network is, so we have to estimate it. But in this case, as I show you the results of the simulation, we know what actually the true network is. And the first step that we, we can uh, do to look at the network is uh, uh, using just uh, simple correlations. But then, of course, we find a lot of spurious connections between the different uh, nodes within the network. Uh, another approach is to I use partial correlations, but then we find, often find um, artificial negative connections, uh, represented here as uh, red edges. Uh, green edges represent positive connections. So we need a method um, that can, can, get, can help us get rid of these artificial connections. And for this, we can use uh, regularized re regression techniques or regularized partial correlation techniques. And what these techniques basically do is that they use fit measures to estimate which two nodes are actually connected to each other. And these techniques um, gen often uh, result in a very accurate estimation of the underlying network, as you can also see here. And um, to make this less abstract, I want to show you uh, a network that we, that we estimated uh, from data um, on evaluative reactions towards Barack Obama. In a, this is based on data from the American National Election Studies and uh, in, in 2012, so right before uh, Barack Obama's uh, re-election. 
And the, the various that were assessed were beliefs toward Barack Obama, like judging as caring and being honest, for example. Um, also feelings were assessed, like feeling angry or feeling proud towards Barack Obama. And um, we already from this, from this graphic representation of the network, we can learn quite a lot. So, for example, we can look at the global structure of this network, and we see that uh, the different nodes are that, there's, that the interconnectedness of the nodes varies. So we find a clustering within this network. And also the uh, color of the nodes correspond to a clustering algorithm that we apply to this network. So nodes of the same color belong to the same cluster. And what we find is that uh, negative feelings form a cluster, positive feelings form a cluster. We also find two clusters within the beliefs. So and one is uh, consisting of beliefs related to warmth generally. So for, exa for example, judging Obama as honest, uh, or moral, and interestingly, also the uh, evaluative judgment that Obama provides good leadership is also included in this cluster, so indicating that it's really uh, influential whether you judge Obama to be to being warm for your judgment whether he provides good leadership. And we also find a more competence-related cluster uh, consisting of beliefs that Obama is knowledgeable and intelligent. And this uh, clustering within networks is a very a typical phenomena we find in real world networks, and it's also one of the uh, two characteristics of small world networks, um, which, which hold that many real world networks show a high degree of clustering, but that also these clusters uh, do not exist in isolation and that they, they are also connected, making the overall network uh, quite closely connected. And we also saw this in the Obama network uh, as these different clusters were not uh, disconnected from each other. And uh, this basic structure of networks has been, has been found for an extremely diverse set uh, of, of networks. In the first paper on this phenomenon by Watson Strogatz, uh, they found that it holds for the power grid of the US, collaboration between film actors, and the neural network of worms. It also, later it was shown that it also holds for the neural networks of monkeys and humans. Also, our language is organized in a small world structure. Psychopatholo psychopathological symptoms are connected in a small world structure. And we also showed that attitudes have a small world structure. And I think this, this illustrates the power of a network analysis to uh, find similarities between very diverse set, sets of research fields so that we can find similarities in uh, psychologic, psychological systems in biological systems and in also even physical systems. So, and uh, apart from looking uh, at, the, at the global structure of the network, we can also look at uh, the specific nodes and what their role is within the network. So, and of course we often are interested in uh, which nodes are the most important ones in the node, and, uh, in the network, sorry. And um, for this, we can use centrality measures. And three very popular centrality measures are betweenness, uh, closeness, and strength. And uh, betweenness is basically is a measure of how often a given node uh, connects to other nodes. So this is a measure of how uh, important the node is in connecting different parts of the network. Uh, closeness uh, measures how uh, well, the, a given node is connected to all the other nodes in the network, both directly and indirectly. So this is a measure of uh, how likely it is that information from a given node will spread throughout the whole network. And uh, strength measures how many connections, uh, direct connections a node has, and therefore it's a measure of how likely it is that this given node will influence uh, other nodes. So as we can see from this analysis, um, the, the evaluative reaction of judging Obama as honest is uh, generally the most important uh, note, or the most central note, indicating that this, that judging Obama as honest or not has really high uh, impact on other evaluative reactions, therefore also on the global evaluation of Barack Obama, and it's also likely that this is a note that is very uh, influential on, for example, whether people voted for or against Barack Obama. So that is more discriminating than uh, other um, nodes in the network. And uh, so up until now, I mostly discussed uh, network descriptives. But of course, we also want to know more about the underlying mechanism uh, of networks and more about the underlying dynamics. And for this, we can use uh, simulations. And uh, we argued that the easing model, which originated in a 
uh, statistical physics is a, a good idealized model of attitude dynamics, which can help us better understand, for example, attitude change or, or attitude uh, formation. And I want to briefly show you an illustration of this. So, and this illustration focuses on the question whether attitudes are actually dimensions or categories, which in my view is probably the most uh, fundamental question you can ask about a given construct. And also, um, given the current political climate, it's also a very important question, I think, because this, this, uh, this question answers whether, um, can provide an answer to whether it's actually that people who are very happy today that uh, Trump is now the uh, president of the United States are really categorically different from people like me who are really, really sad that he, now, that he is now the president of the United States. And um, so for this we can look at the, uh, at the connectivity of the attitude network and on the left side you see a network that is quite weakly connected and on the right side uh, you see the overall the state of the network, the, how likely it is that the network will acquire a given state measured by the sum score of the evaluative reactions. And as you can see, we find a quite, for this network, we find a quite um, normally distrib distribution of the sum scores, indicating that with weakly connected networks, um, the construct or the attitude behaves uh, like a dimension, so that you can switch from being, for example, slightly positive to being neutral, and then to being slightly negative, for example. But let's see what happens if we increase the connectivity. So, uh, oh, sorry. Now it should work, yeah. So, um, as you can see, if the connectivity of the network increases, um, the distribution of the sum scores becomes much more uh, bimodal, so indicating that the attitude now uh, uh, behaves much more like a category. So, uh, and this is basically uh, what I think is happening uh, in, the, in American politics in the last couple of years. And so, this, this illustrates in that with simulations we can actually provide an answer why uh, this is sometimes the case that attitudes uh, behave as dimensions and sometimes they behave, behave as categories. And um, we also showed that, that uh, connectivity of attitude networks very, um, seems to be a very fundamental property of attitude networks. So um, we first showed that uh, strong attitudes generally correspond to, uh, very, uh, to, to highly connected networks, which also fits with the idea that strong attitudes um, are more stable and more resistant than weak attitudes. And we also uh, found that um, also the whether uh, attitude influences uh, behavior um, that depends on the connectivity of the attitude network. So, um, for example, and we, we looked at this in the context of uh, voting decisions in the American uh, elections from 1980 to 2012, and uh, the, for example, the attitude network towards Barack Obama in uh, 2012 was uh, very, very highly connected. And in this case, the attitude almost perfectly predicted um, whether or not uh, a person voted for Barack Obama. In the, the attitude towards um, uh, George Bush in 1992 uh, was a much less uh, connected network. And in this case, also the attitude predicted um, predicted whether, whether um, people voted for or against George Bush uh, less, much less well than in the case of the, for example, the Obama network. So, um, to conclude, uh, it is my view that, uh, that network theory and analysis provides a promising framework for understanding the complexity of social psychology. It also connects uh, social psychology to, uh, to the natural sciences and also to other uh, social sciences. It provides tools for both estimation, estimation and simulation of uh, psychological constructs, which I think makes it a quite unique framework. And um, also, I think it's the, the measurement model we can use from network analysis is much uh, more closely connected how we really think about many uh, psychological uh, constructs than, for example, latent variable model. And I think, therefore, it closes the gap between psychometric and uh, social psychological theorizing. Thank you very much for your attention.
If, if I got the question right, you, you're asking about the null models we, we compare. So, um, uh, well, actually, so if we, if we look at centrality, we don't really test against uh, null models. Um, for example, but in the case of, for example, small networks, uh, we, we compare uh, whether uh, this, the, the, the network to, uh, to uh, just a random network and use this as a null uh, model. Uh, yeah, so the question was whether there are any implications for changing attitudes, and uh, yeah, there are actually quite a lot. So first of all, this also relates uh, to the connectivity of attitude networks, because um, we know that highly connected networks are much uh, less likely to change, but if they change, they really change in an all or none fashion, and weakly connected networks change much more gradually, and also the centrality of nodes can, also use, can be also used to predict uh, whether given persuasion techniques uh, will work better for this, for one given attitude and other persuasion techniques for, for another attitude. Um, so the question is whether we also not only inter looked at um, uh, networks of one attitude but also of inter-attitudinal -attitud uh, systems and so we, we haven't r used these techniques to look at this yet but it's really, it's, it's definitely a plan what, what we would like to do and also I think um, um, there, there are some people in uh, Tilburg University who are looking at, uh, at ideology, uh, ideology from, from a network perspective and looking how these different uh, aspects of the ideology uh, relate to each other from a, from a network perspective. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>
why this is important, I, I sort of want to give you a window of how you know, we in, in our social perception research have used this, but then at the end of the talk more generally talk about how it's used in many different areas. But in face perception, social perception, something I'm very interested in, um, you know, a, a study done over 15 years ago showed that you know, in monkeys, if you look in temporal cortex when they're staring at a face like this, uh, information is accumulating continuously over hundreds of milliseconds. So what you're seeing is the amount of face information that's transiently represented across the temporal cortex over time. And you're seeing, you know, leading up to 600 milliseconds, there's this gradual accumulation of evidence, uh, you know, of uh, what face identity that is. And so the, the only point is just that there, there are complex dynamics that underlie these processes that we're interested in, and they occur over hundreds of milliseconds. And it would be nice if we had a measure to gain insights into that real-time process. So what we often do is uh, use uh, a computer mouse tracking technique so we can look at participants' hand movements and route to particular responses. And the idea is that so long as they are moving while the stimulus processing is still ongoing before they've stabilized onto a given response, we can actually um, uh, look at the tentative commitments of, uh, 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 to those different alternatives based on the trajectory of their movement. Um, so there might be a sort of partial attraction to that female category, for example, here. Um, and so this is unbeknownst to subjects. People don't know that we're recording their movements. And, you know, in general, what this will allow us to do is open up, you know, these discrete responses we commonly measure in the field into these, um, you know, really rich continuous processes that we can measure where the actual motor trajectory response, the hand movement, is coextensive with the underlying cognitive or social cognitive process. So in our research, just to give you a quick window into how we've used this, um, we have developed a, a computational model uh, of uh, which we call the dynamic interactive model of uh, initial perceptions. And the, the big point here, which is what I want to talk about, is that not only do facial features activate a social categories like gender, race, age categories, which in turn automatically activate stereotypes, but those stereotypes can actually immediately constrain categories, which can immediately constrain representation of features. So stereotypes can impact visual perception of faces and of social categories while perception is still unfolding during this real-time process. And that's really a central tenet of this model that we're very interested in. Why does this occur? It's consistent with the way that we now understand the human brain works, where there would be this dynamic interaction between bottom-up processing of a face and top-down expectations informed by, say, stereotypical associations. Um, we've, this is one particular instantiation of the model, and I don't want to go into details about the model and, and bore you about it, um, but just to quickly give you a, a, an idea, these are nodes organized into four different levels of processing that can be connected through these positive excitatory connections or negative inhibitory connections, and this system is stimulated by both bottom-up input of a face and top-down input from an intentional system that's directing our attention either towards uh, gender or race categories. And here you see stereotypes are bidirectional related to categories. So as the male category gets activated, it starts activating a stereotype like aggressive, but as that aggressive stereotype starts to get activated, it starts exciting the category male and inhibiting the category female. So there's this dynamic back and forth between every node in the system and all those connected to it at the same time until the system gradually settles into a stable steady state that reflects a kind of compromise between uh, the stereotypes we're bringing to the table as perceivers in our own, um, and the, the actual visual cues before our eyes, and that's the idea. Um, but I just want you to keep this in mind because it makes some unique theoretical predictions that I'll talk about in a second. Okay, so as one example, this was a study we did a few years ago where we have a race continuum from white to black due to stereotypical associations in the US that link blacks to low status and whites to high status. We found that particularly when the face was racially ambiguous, that people's race categorizations were biased by the attire cues. So for example, the face above uh, in the middle is, um, Oh, it does work, okay. Um, is perceived to be more likely to be white, whereas this face is more likely to be perceived as black. We can look even more interesting, I think, is the actual mouse movements, where we found that even when a participant ultimately categorized a face as white, if that face was surrounded by low status attire, um, then we saw this partial attraction to the opposite category response. So for example, even though this participant ultimately categorizes this face as white, there's nevertheless this sort of 
partial attraction to select the black category response on the opposite side of the screen. So in this case, this is really this idea of this dynamic interaction between the baggage we're bringing to the table and our expectations based on stereotypes and visual cues, even if the ultimate categorization is not biased wholesale by that information. Um, some of you that are interested in dynamical systems such as this computational model, you can also conceive of this as attractor basins where essentially you know, these category responses are really serving as attractors that are um, attracting the system to settle into that state. And you can generate this kind of energy landscape based on the computational model and, and sort of look at these multiple levels in tandem with one another. Okay, what are some of the measures? There are many different measures that you can get from these kinds of data. Very basic ones to collapse this very rich time series data into a couple parameters is to calculate an idealized straight line trajectory and from that calculate things like maximum deviation or area under the curve, both which measure how much you know, attraction there is to the opposite category. You can also look at, you know, that's, that's the magnitude of activation. But you can also look at other things which are independent from that, like the stability of that. So in terms of what we call X flips or the number of directional changes along the X axis, the axis of decision, which can tell you a little bit about the stability or instability, rapid fluctuations between representations and complexity. Um, these are just a few of the different measures. So, and, and we have a software, you can, it's free, it's online, you can design, analyze, run, you can do all of this um, work uh, in a very graphics-based easy way, so download it if you're interested. Um, so one handle that we've tried to, to um, use to get into this idea of stereotypes impacting face perception is category interactions, and we tend to think of race, emotion, sex, these things as independent and orthogonal because they are in reality, they have nothing to do with one another, presumably in reality, but psychologically that's not the case. And if you think of race and gender, for example, and if you think of the stereotype contents related to those categories, there are some that are independently related to black and male, but then for whatever reason, there's a whole host of stereotypes that are incidentally shared between these two categories. The same is observed for, say, Asian and female, where for whatever reason, there's a whole host of stereotypes shared between these. Now, what the computational model predicts is that actually, you know, as the male category activates, it starts to activate a stereotype automatically, but that starts to, because of this bidirectionality, starts to feed back to the black category, which means that black men will be perceived more efficiently and Asian women will be per perceived more efficiently, and that male category activating will facilitate a black categorization and actually potentially make faces appear to be more black than they are. And same with Asian and female. We've tested this um, recently and we use um, a uh, fMRI technique called multivoxel pattern analysis. And so if you imagine kind of diving into a region involved in face perception like the fusiform cortex, Here's a bunch of toy neurons. And if this region codes for gender, there's going to be a male pattern, there's going to be a female pattern. Um, now, if this region also happens to code for race, we can look for a race pattern as well. And what's of interest is how similar are the black and male categories here. So in this case, black and male tend to be quite similar relative to the female category. And so we can look in these regions to assess what is the neural pattern similarity between these. In this case, black and male have high similarity, black and female have low similarity. So what we did, I'm not gonna go into details of the study. If you're interested, please ask me after. We have faces varying on emotion, gender, and race. And essentially, what we're able to do is for every subject, we're able to assess with no faces, just conceptually, for all these pairs of categories, black and male, Asian and female, black and angry, um, all, all of the pairs of gender, race, and emotion, how conceptually similar in stereotype contents are these based on a conceptual task. And then we look at mouse tracking in terms of where do we see these biases. So for example, for a subject, if they viewed black and angry conceptually to be more similar, that predicted black and angry faces being perceived more similarly assessed by mouse tracking. So a happy black face is you see a swerving towards the angry category. So this conceptual bias predicts a mouse tracking perceptual bias, which in turn predicts how similar these neural patterns are in certain brain regions, like black faces and angry faces elicit neural patterns that are similar in the fusiform cortex, um, a basic mechanism of face perception. Uh, and, and what that tells us is that um, 
stereotypes are impacting a very early level of visual representation of faces in the brain, which is quite um, interesting. And so mouse tracking combined with fMRI, especially with multivariate fMRI, I think can be incredibly powerful. It's starting to identify at what level of neural representation we are observing certain kinds of biases. This is in social perception. You could do this with attitudes or many other kinds of um, constructs you're interested in. Okay, so that was um, stereotypes and face perception. The model also makes uh, a number of predictions about um, other cases of perception, like when we have uh, ambiguous faces. And with racial ambiguity, it, the ambiguity in race can really open the door to a lot of different top-down factors, things like interracial exposure and people's experiences, um, intergroup experiences with, with different kinds of races and how, this cate how race categories might be perceived. So we've shown for a while, oh, sorry, we've shown for a while now that, you know, when you have slightly atypical faces that these elicit deviation effects towards the opposite category, which is hardly surprising, right? So a slightly, uh, a white face with slight Afrocentric cues elicits an attraction effect to the other category, reflecting a dynamic competition between partially active categories, both white and black, competing over time to settle into one given perception, which is conforms to a, uh, to a number of predictions that the model makes. And so we've done a lot of work with that. What the model also predicts, which we've recently tested, is that if conceptually, individual perceivers have different levels of um, uh, overlap between the white and black categories conceptually. So a lot of work in intergroup uh, research has shown that individuals with low levels of interracial exposure view white and black categories conceptually very different, whereas people with high levels of interracial exposure tend to view these things conceptually a little bit more overlapping. Now what the model predicts on the basis of that is that people that have this more differentiated conceptual representations of these categories will cause this instability perceptually. I'm not gonna go into details into why. I mean, if you're interested, please ask me. But it comes down, essentially what happens is when the visual system is, you know, is, visual processing is presenting a racially ambiguous face and wants to push the system towards, um, towards the middle of these two attractor states, essentially, and towards a state of racial ambiguity, while conceptual knowledge is trying to rapidly pull these categories apart if you have a very differentiated category representation. So low exposure perceivers, their visual processing is trying to push the system to a state of racial ambiguity while conceptual knowledge is trying to rapidly pull these things apart because these are very distinct concepts. That's the idea and it causes instability that would manifest not in the magnitude of activation but in, in X flips, in this flip flopping in mouse tracking in terms of rapid fluctuations in these white and black categories. So what, I'm not gonna give too many details on the study but we, have, we did this uh, on Mechanical Turk with hundreds of subjects uh, across the country and we're looking here at X flips and what we found was that Participants with lower levels of interracial exposure, these are white participants, participants with lower levels of interracial exposure showed this um, uh, effect of ambiguity where they're showing very kind of unstable directional changes um, relative to higher levels of interracial exposure. There was also changes in the velocity profile of these dynamics um, uh, consistent with this. If you're interested in that, please ask me after. Um, finally, uh, more recently, we've wanted to ask, you know, okay, but we're constraining subjects to two categories, white and black. What if you actually give them the option of a third category, like biracial? And what we found essentially from these studies is that interestingly, even when participants are given the option of a biracial categorization, reflexively they show a tendency for monoracial categorization. So if participants in a two-choice task idiosyncratically categorize a biracial face as white, um, they would initially deviate towards the white category when given the option of a biracial categorization and vice versa for a black category. There wasn't a lot of evidence for hypodescent here. It was more that for each face, people have an idiosyncratic perception and that comes out um, initially before they can arrive at their multiracial categorization. And this actually had evaluative implications where um, participants that swerved a little bit more towards the black category, which is perceived as uh, more negatively usually, um, that predicted trustworthiness ratings for those faces. So if you swerve towards a black category before saying biracial for a, a, a biracial face, you tended to rate that face as less trustworthy a little bit. So there's evaluative implications here. Okay, so that's sort of a window from social perception. I incredibly quickly want to just give you a, a very quick sense of other uh, uh, applications of this. 
So self-control researchers have done a lot of work with mouse tracking. So you can sort of look at, okay, do you want the healthy option or the unhealthy option as one example. This was a beautiful study done in psych science where essentially you're looking at the millisecond resolution timing of different processes, which is a big power of mouse tracking. And what they're looking at is in milliseconds, when in timing are people swerving to the other, towards the other response. And what they find is that people with lower levels of self, uh, sorry, trait self-control how, compute the tastiness uh, of a food item much earlier than the healthfulness of a food item. So, and they're able to do this based on milliseconds in mouse tracking. If you're interested in this, I can explain how they do it after the talk. But this is a really powerful technique. It provides a sort of mechanism of dietary um, lapses of self, or lapses of dietary self-control. But you can look at millisecond resolution timing with mouse tracking data and dissociate the computation of different kinds of things during a decision process. We've done some work with cr cross-culturally, looking at essentially as participants try to incorporate the visual context in perceiving a face, we also use looking at millisecond resolution timing, and essentially we find cross-cultural differences in how early in processing participants are incorporating the context. People from a high context culture like China tend to incorporate the visual context earlier on. People who assess attitudes have looked at sort of the, you know, how, the, how um, negative or sorry, how uh, more relatively more implicit and explicit attitudes coalesce into stable responses and sort of disentangling dual process versus dynamic models of attitudes. Um, personality researchers have used things like with self-esteem in terms of buffering against attacks to self-esteem. So what these researchers call adaptive disengagement, where you are rating um, essentially how relevant something is to your self-esteem. And if you are given negative feedback about something, you're gonna switch domains and put your self-esteem in another domain. They're able to get at this implicit measure of self-esteem here, almost done. Uh, moral cognition, where you're looking at these trolley dilemmas and looking at kind of deontological versus utilitarian responses. And uh, political psychology, looking at uh, conservatives being more aversive to uh, states of negativity and avoiding certain stimuli. And many, certainly in, in cognitive science, more generally, a lot of people are using it. So my only point is just that this is really, you know, any measure that is looking at, any study that's looking at reaction time in theory could really be opened up to examining real-time dynamics with um, getting at a lot of different things with mouse tracking. Um, so mouse tracking get, can get us towards real-time social cognitive dynamics, which I think is very important, has a lot of theoretical value. Um, it, why is this better than reaction times, you might be saying? It measures genuine parallel activation of a specific response, not merely a delay in processing. Um, this becomes very clear when you have multi-choice, like three-choice or four-choice tasks. But rather than simply delay or indecision or uncertainty, you can actually get it, you know, which response are they in parallel attracted to? Where is that delay coming from? I think an incredibly important aspect is this, it measures millisecond resolution uh, accumulation of evidence in favor of multiple potential responses, and that can be used for any number of processes. Um, it measures not only magnitude of a parallel activation, but also the stability or instability as shown with these X flips or complexity. Um, and I think combining with computational models or with brain imaging can yield a lot of powerful insights, um, also with electrophysiology too. So um, with all of that, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there's time. I'm not sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, hi everyone, thank you for coming today um, and thank you for inviting me to talk about my perspective on how we can use uh, mobile sensing methods in social and personality psychology. And so today I'm going to be talking about the work that I've been doing, basically using the mobile sensors that are embedded in our devices and the devices that we carry around with us every day, particularly our smartphones, and how our smartphones can be used to capture information about real world behaviors and our everyday situations. Um, and so I started getting into this work because I was really interested in capturing behavior in context. And so I spent um, a large part of my PhD work working with a computer scientist who were developing these methods, um, but were doing so in very much of like a prototype fashion. So they would develop um, sensing applications that participants could uh, download to their phones 
but they were not able to scale out and they didn't really have psychological research questions that were driving these, these research studies. And so um, what I'll be talking about today is what mobile sensing methods are and how we can use them in social and personality research and talk about some of the opportunities that they provide for our studies. And so um, first, broadly, you might be interested, wondering like why should we even use mobile sensing? Well, one of the main um, advantages that I see to these methods are that already many people around the world are using them. According to Pew Research, 64% of US adults uh, own smartphones and carry them around with them every day. And the rates are increasing worldwide in countries around the world. So what this does is it allows us to really reach global populations. If you develop a study or a survey that you have programmed in an app and you put that on the app store, you can start to reach people that are all around the world and we can move beyond our you know, university campuses. The second main point is that they provide objective assessments of behavior, so we can move beyond asking people to report about their behaviors and report about their situational experiences by capturing objective data from the sensors um, on the devices themselves. Um, third point being that they operate unobtrusively and continuously in the background. So participants can just go about their daily lives and these devices will record information in the background and so you get much more data per participant and in a longitudinal um, fashion. And I'm not saying that these should replace any of the existing methods. I actually think that they complement existing methods quite well because you can start to combine traditional surveys with um, context-aware um, sur survey, like ecological momentary assessments, basically. So what I mean by that is that you can program this application to, if you're interested, for example, in how people's moods fluctuate across their day or across different situations that they experience, you can program these applications to, prov to ping the user with a notification that asks them to rate their mood every time the GPS data indicates that they've entered a new location. So when the participant gets to work, they'll get a new um, notification that asks them to report on their mood or their stress level. And you can um, program these context aware surveys in many different ways. So I'll talk a bit now just about what mobile sensing is and, and what I mean by capturing behavior using these sensors. So um, the basic idea here is that each phone, as part of its natural functioning, comes, embed, comes with many different sensors embedded in them. Um, up here on, the, on your right, you have a list of some of the most common sensors and the most commonly um, used sensors in this area of research. And so, what, um, how this works is that you basically have a sensing app that participants install on their devices or that you give them a phone that has the app installed depending on how you design your study. And the app can record um, information about their phone use, so their, their application use logs, like how often they go on Facebook, the different types of things they do with the phone, calling, texting, incoming, outgoing, durations, you know, everything that the phone really mediates is recorded in some way for the function of the device. And we can start to mine this information to really understand what people are doing and in in how they're um, experiencing things in their natural lives. And so these are just some of the sensors um, that are commonly collected, as I mentioned, and I'll talk a bit about them more in detail. And then uh, the point being that you can also uh, include surveys to capture people's thoughts and feelings as they're, as they're going about their day. Uh, and so the way that, the, the, that we capture behavior from sensors, essentially, I'm going to walk through just one example here, two examples. But what you have here are the sensors that I mentioned um, that are most commonly uh, collected and, and then that are on virtually every single device. And on the other side, so on your right again, you have the different types of behaviors that they can be used to infer. And so the way this works is that the app will collect raw sensor data. So let's say information from the microphone. And you, ba you basically process this microphone data to infer things about what is going, around, going on around the user. So you can infer whether they're engaged in conversation, whether they're around voices, whether they're in a silent environment, what their ambient um, environment is basically like. Some, um, some studies have looked at noise versus silence, for example. 
Um, and you can also combine different types of sensors to capture different behaviors. So sleeping patterns, for example, um, there was this great study in, uh, the computer, in computing that recently came out a couple, like two years ago that basically developed an algorithm to predict sleeping duration by weighting whether the microphone, whether the phone was silent, it was charging, it was nighttime, and it was stationary, it hadn't been used in a while, and they were able to infer sleeping durations within plus or minus 42 minutes. So you can start to um, think of different ways to combine these sensors to obtain higher level information about behavior. And so here are some examples of um, studies in the computing community and the types of behaviors that they've been used, that they've been developing and inferring from the various mobile sensors. Um, they can be categorized as psychological states, social interactions, activities, and mobility. And this is really just done in computing with very small samples, and I think one of the main opportunities for psychologists who want to use these methods is to find out what are the psychometrics of these behaviors, are they valid, are they reliable, can we scale them out, and can we, what can we learn about these types of behaviors that we haven't been able to capture in the wild before. So just to illustrate um, what this data looks like, I'm just going to show an example from one of the studies that we conducted, um, myself and some of our colleagues at Dartmouth College, where we studied the daily lives of students as they progress throughout an academic term. And so here you'll ha you see, uh, this is a map of Dartmouth uh, campus, and this is one student, um, and we'll call him um, let's say Sam, and so he woke up at 9.40 a.m., and this is all sensed by the device, so he slept for nine hours, he was at his dorm engaged in conversation for three minutes, then he went to class, he was with 29 other people, sitting down for most of that time, then he went to the dining hall and he was around 10 other people, engaged in conversation for 40 minutes, goes back to his dorm, is with four other people, possibly his roommates, also engaged in conversation, goes to the gym in the evening, uh, spends some time there, less stationary, um, so more active, then goes to the frat house, um, spends his uh, e later evening in the frat house where he's also around other people, spending more time more active, and goes back home and is asleep for 20 minutes by midnight. And so I show you this just to give you an idea of the kind of portrait and the really fine-grained amount of information that our devices already know and are collecting about us, and how we can start to use these um, approaches to understand um, people in the context of their, of their real lives. And here you have just the, the aggregated information about this person's day. So depending on what level of um, analysis you're interested in, whether you're interested in um, hourly patterns or daily patterns, this particular student was around 43 people for about seven hours, had slept nine hours. So what I'll do with the rest of um, my time is just mostly focus on the opportunities and some of the work that's been done in this area so far and um, point to ways that we can contribute to this area of research or integrate it into our, um, our own work. And then I'll briefly talk about some of the practical considerations and challenges. So, so one of the big um, things I think that as a personality psychologist that excites me the most is that we will be able to really understand behavior in real life and be able to map it on and, and look at it how it passes over time. And so here you have just an example of, these are all sense behaviors of students that we collected um, over a term showing how their behaviors fluctuate um, depending on the, the day of the week of the term. And you can see the effects of midterms here, like the gym visits drop down and, and never recover. Another. Um, Another opportunity is to understand psychological processes in context, and there's been some work in this area that integrates um, survey approaches with GPS data, and they're able to look at how people's thoughts and feelings are um, changing across the different locations that they visit each day. A third uh, area of, of opportunity is predicting life outcomes and designing interventions, and most of this work has been um, focused on mental health outcomes. So Research in this area has shown that you can predict whether a person's in a depressive state or in a schizophrenic, um, having a schizophrenic episode based on things like their mobility patterns, whether they're leaving the house or not. 
Um, and the implication being that if we can detect these things, we can start to design interventions that would um, help them. Fourth is uh, examining people's social networks. So um, our smartphones are you know, our communication devices, and studies have looked at how we can start to understand people's strong and weak ties and be able to help them um, navigate their social networks. And this fifth um, final point about the opportunities is that we can start to think, I think one of the strengths about this method is that we can think about how we might benefit participants. So in one of our ongoing studies, we had um, people who were using these apps receive personal feedback about their behaviors over time each day. And then we asked them, did you learn anything new about yourself? And if so, what did you learn? And we find that many of the participants do report learning new things and that some of them even uh, suggest in their written responses that they want to change their behavior now. So this example is of a student who mentioned that she didn't realize she was alone all the time and now she wants to go out and make new friends. So I think we can use these tools to help people um, to promote self-insight and positive behavior change. And so I'm only going to talk about the practical considerations um, very, very briefly. Um, the, the most, um, the, the real practical element here that needs to be considered is the different elements of, design, of setting up the study. So it helps to have an interdisciplinary team or just somebody who has some programming skills. Um, the, back end, the sensing system requires some um, setup, and I'm happy to talk about these details with anyone who's, more in, who's interested in, in this um, information. We also have a paper out that talks about it in much more, uh, much more detail. And then selecting the, the type of phone you want to use and the app that you want to use. And then in terms of the challenges, one of the first thing that happens when you run one of these studies is that you have massive, massive amounts of, of information, and you have to really think about how do you want to analyze it and, and what approaches can you use and do you have the skill sets to do so. And so that's where the interdisciplinary team helps, but also um, one of the main issues is just knowing at what level of analysis you want to aggregate your, your data. So if you're interested, this is just an example of activity levels obtained from the accelerometer. Um, and you can see over 66 days, there are many different fluctuations, and it looks like a time series trend. But if you aggregate out to the weekly level, which is on the edge there, um, you see a much cleaner curve that could potentially be modeled with like a longitudinal, um, like a growth model, for example. And you could see that clear decline. So figuring out these, um, the ways that we, the tools and skills that we need to analyze these data is one of the challenges. And then the ethical challenges. Um, this is obviously a very uh, big element of this work. One of the things that we find uh, we suggest in terms of guidelines in, in starting this type of research is really to be transparent with your participants, of course. They should, only, they should always opt in to these studies. Um, transparency in terms of what the app is collecting, what um, the sampling rates are, if you can give the participant as much control as possible over what is collected. So some of the apps that we've used will um, you know, give you the pop-up notification about enabling whether you want that phone to collect your... So, so for example, when you download an app and you get the, the question about do you want to allow this app to collect your location, we have that for each different sensor or type of information that the app wants to collect, and that allows the participant to decide when they what and um, what, what information they want to allow access to. Um, privacy concerns, this totally depends also, um, the extent to which this is an issue also depends on the type of data you're collecting. So if you're collecting content of information, if you're collecting content of text messages, that's you know, a whole area to, to talk about. And there's, this is, I think, something that, is an ongoing dis that will be an ongoing discussion as these methods become more widespread. Um, the data security, is something that you have to build into the system, basically, that the, the app will send the information to your servers using like an SSL encryption, which is similar to what bank what you use when you sign into your bank accounts. Um, and then I think the other element is that if we're going to be asking participants to give us this type of data, we really have to think about what are the benefits to the participant. How can we try to improve their lives by um, showing them either feedback or helping them um, understand their own behavioral patterns? Um, and so if you'd like more information about this work, we have a paper that came out um, recently 
that describes many, goes into much more detail about the practical considerations um, and challenges and also opportunities. And then this link, the second link here, this is uh, our colleagues, some of my collaborators and I, we've made a public a data set available publicly that has uh, mobile sensing data from 48 students. So the, the graphs that I'd showed earlier, uh, that's publicly available. You can just go on there and download the data set and if you want to get started trying to use these methods. And then we're having a professional development session on Saturday at 5 that will talk about some of this in more practical detail. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, so the question was, what's the lead time or how, how much time does it take to develop the apps? Uh, it depends on what app you want to use. So there are kind of, there's three different categories, really. There's commercially available ones that you can just pay someone to use for however long your study is. Um, the benefit of that is that you don't have to deal with any of the setup at all. Um, the downside is that you don't have control over which sensors it's sampling or the sampling rates. If you develop your own app, um, the, the downside of that is really that it's always going to be buggy unless you have a hired programmer. So I would actually recommend using either a commercial app or an open source app, which is the third option. Uh, and the open source apps, there are a few of them, and I can tell you some of the examples uh, if you'd like. But they, have, um, they basically are groups of computer scientists who've developed the software and the information about what needs to go into the system. And then they make all of that code available, and it's online. Uh, and has documentation and everything. So that's, I would think, the easiest way to, to go about it. Hey, thank you. So, hello. Um, I will be talking about applying social network processes to understanding community-wide interventions. Um, I just want to first clarify a little bit about uh, social network processes and what I mean with this in comparison to the first talk. Um, so when I talk about first, uh, social network processes, I'm talking about connections between people, uh, not so much processes happening within an individual. Um, I will talk a little bit briefly uh, about how these two approaches can be combined, and I hope to clarify more what social network processes are all about. Now, um, before I start, so just to um, give you a very, very brief illustration um, about some of the limitations of longitudinal designs. Um, I like this metaphor, some people might not, but uh, it always gets me thinking about longitudinal designs. If you think about, uh, let's imagine an alien spaceship coming to Earth for the very first time, okay? Now this alien spaceship and the alien within it observes a train station, a very busy one. And what happens is that every single time when people meet up at the platform, after this, a train comes to pick him up. So what does this mean to the alien? Well, he or she or it reasons that basically the number of people standing on the platform predicts this train coming. Even more, the number of people causes the train to come. Now, this example just shows very uh, simply how longitudinal designs don't imply causality, but um, yeah. Now to move on from this, uh, how can we improve these kinds of longitudinal studies? Well, one way is to move on to interventions, especially within community designs. So the idea here is to intervene and study changes within a natural, uh, naturalistic setting, such as a community. And to give you an example of that, a quite well-known example in, in terms of intervention studies, is Project Northland. So Project Northland was implemented here in the US where 24 school districts and their surrounding communities were e either assigned to a random um, intervention condition or to waitlist control condition. And by introducing a combination of different interventions, a uh, decline in alcohol use was observed after the intervention was implemented. Now, the combination of intervention components consisted of things like uh, school-based curricula changes, parental involvement, uh, peer leadership ch uh, training. Um, the point is, so there was a reduced alcohol uh, consumption that was found, but why was this the case? So what kind of mechanisms explained that? 
Uh, in order to know this, one should then study the underlying mediating processes that might explain the changes that were found after the intervention was implemented. In this case, they found that perceived peer norms changed in terms of pro-social uh, peer norms, and this explained partially uh, the reduction in alcohol use. So the idea here is that interventions in communities can be very beneficial for studying these uh, causal processes, and I want to um, take up one specific example, namely um, talking about community network processes as explanatory mechanisms for uh, what happens after an intervention has been implemented. Now first, what are community networks? So the idea is very easy, the implementation is quite difficult. So if we take a whole community and we let all the participants within a community participate, and then we capture all the ongoing, or as many as possible, ongoing social processes, such as possible friendship choices. So how, who do I select as a friend? And if we study this over time, uh, what we get are these so-called community networks. What you see here, um, I'm afraid it's not very visible, um, but it's an uh, example of that, of a Swedish community where all the adolescents between the ages of 10 to 18 participated each year in a large project, and they nominated their friends each year during this assessment. And what you can't see, but I'll have other pictures to demonstrate this more clearly, um, is that every single individual is connected to every single other individual within this community, directly or indirectly. And the idea here is that we get a very comprehensive image of what kind of connections individual, individuals have with each other, as well as individual development over time. So we can combine these two components in these studies. Now, these kinds of changes that occur in the individuals and in the relationships can be captured with two different processes. So one is called social selection. Social selection is about how individuals shape their social worlds through their active and passive choices of others. So for example, um, if I base my choices for friends on my music taste that I already have, then my music taste is predicting the choices that I make up for friendships. Now, on the other side, we have social influence processes. So this is after the friendships have been formed, how do the friends influence my attributes? So for example, do my friends' music tastes influence my own music taste over time? Um, Important here is to mention that within communities or in any kind of real life settings, these processes can happen simultaneously. So traditionally, a lot of research in this field, uh, both from social psychology and also from developmental psychology, has focused on disentangling selection from influence. So looking at what drives um, the changes within the relationships or within the individual. Now, um, we see that in a lot of studies, these two processes happen simultaneously. Uh, to take the example again, so my music taste, if I select someone based on my existing music taste, and um, this person then subsequently influences my music taste over time, this would be uh, an example of these simultaneous processes. Now, we have the idea of community interventions and we have these social network processes. And now I'm going to try and illustrate how to combine the two and why I think that's very useful. Um, so just to take a very um, simple example here, five individuals, so A to E, uh, with uh, the darker shades indicating, let's stick to mo music taste again, a preference for dance music. So number A here, our person A has a very strong preference and E doesn't have a preference for dance music. Now, at time one, we don't see any friendships between these uh, individuals. Now, um, traditionally, the studies on social network processes focus on then explaining how these friendships fo uh, are formed over time. So here we see that person A selects person C as a friend, uh, but not, does not select person e, uh, e or D as a friend, meaning that people with similar music tastes have selected each other as friends. This is called social selection. Now the idea here is that if you implement then an intervention in between these processes, you can study what kind of mechanisms underlie social selection here. The same applies for social influence. So if we instead take an existing friendship network 
and we study how these friends influence each other over time. So in this case, people have become more similar in music taste, uh, indicated by the, more, uh, the stronger similarity in shading of the ovals. Um, this will be called social influence, but if we then implement an intervention here, we can examine how these influence processes were initiated. I want to stick with the example of social selection here, uh, just because I also have a concrete example after this. Um, so how would this look pragma uh, pragmatically, so in a concrete example? Um, let's say we take a control group, so again, having these five individuals, um, but now uh, the purple ovals here indicate members from one ethnic group and the white ovals members from another ethnic group. Now, in the control condition, there's no intervention and what one typically finds is so-called ethnic homophily. People with a similar ethnic background tend to select each other as friends. In the intervention condition, in contrast, we start off the same way, but we implement an intervention. So in this case, one could, for example, stimulate contact opportunities and communication opportunities between these individuals with different ethnicities. And in turn, one would then predict that perhaps there are more inter-ethnic friendships as a result of this. Right, so the contrast here in the results can be attributed to the specific intervention component. Now, again, I want to make it even more concrete by taking up an example of a study that I'm currently working on. So these are preliminary results. Um, it's a field intervention that I've been evaluating in Oldham in the UK at the University of Oxford. Um, basically, Oldham, the UK, has had a history of quite um, troublesome relationships between different ethnic groups. Some of you might remember this, um, but in 2001, for example, there were a series of violent clashes between white British and so-called Asian British, which are individuals who identify with the Pakistani and Indian heritage. Um, and in 2010, the Department for Education in the UK decided to implement a series of interventions. One of them was merging of segregated schools involving high school students. Um, the idea was that within this community, uh, the two populations, so to say, had very uh, limited contact. They literally lived on the other side of town. Uh, the idea was by, by merging the segregated schools, we would create intergroup contact possibilities, meaning that these Asian British and white British could potentially form friendships and beneficial relationships. Now, um, you might think this is a very risky operation in such a conflict-ridden area, but it was also um, maintained, so to say, or stimulated with a couple of pre-tests and also positive uh, reinforcement in terms of sports activities that the pupils shared. Uh, but I won't go into d detail here. What I want to focus on is this as an example for studying social network processes. Uh, just to give you an uh, idea about how the school merger worked, uh, so there were 26 schools in total in the entire community. I'm just telling, giving you an example here for six schools. Uh, I don't know if you can read this, but I'll explain it uh, hope hopefully very clearly here. Um, so the two orange boxes here indicate two schools before the merger that were very um, uh, uniform in terms of ethnic diversity. So uh, the one school here in, on the uh, left is a very is dominated with Asian British pupils, so to say, and the second school here has almost only uh, white British pupils. Now these two schools were then merged, creating almost a 50-50 split in terms of ethnic diversity. Now there was a whole varying range of these kinds of combinations. So here we have a school that was merged and ending up with 32% Asian British. And uh, this school was a merger of two almost entirely white British schools, ending up with almost an entirely white British school. Now, these schools were then, and the pupils within them, um, were tested before the merger at two time points, after the merger, and then followed up until January 2016. It, this study is still ongoing. Uh, each year with a multitude of different measurements, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> such as uh, observations. So there were survey measurements, there were interviews, but one form which I particularly find interesting here um, are observations done during lunchtime. So in the school canteen, 
uh, the seating arrangements, according to a number of factors, including ethnicity, were observed. Um, so I don't know if you can see it here, but this yellow boxes indicate white British. Um, and here, for example, you see a table almost entirely consisting of white British uh, pupils, except for one Asian British pupil. So just to give you an illustration of the types of measurements that we used, um, and I will very briefly talk about the results, so the outcome measures. Uh, I want to focus more on the underlying processes here. But overall, most measures indicated that when ethnic diversity was more balanced after such a merger, um, there were more positive outcomes. So to illustrate this, what you see here is a standardized difference score between 2012 and 16. Uh, the orange school represents the school where there was this almost balanced ethnic um, um, diversity, whereas the purple bar indicates the school that was still white British. The same was found for the Asian British schools. Um, if you look at this, for example, in terms of intergroup anxiety, so how much fear a person holds towards the other uh, ethnic group, you see a decrease um, in anxiety over time for this, um, for this school where the ethnic diversity was more balanced. Now, I want to move on to explain these kinds of results. So overall, the more balanced ethnic diversity was, the more positive results tended to be. Um, and one process that, we, uh, that I looked at in terms of these analyses was in terms of direct outgroup friendships. So the idea here is that if someone forms an intergroup friendship, this formation, so this process over time, might explain the, the results that we find, the differences between the schools. So, um, just to illustrate this, these are 25 pupils, and um, the gray box represents the Asian British and the white box white British, and there's an intergroup friendship here. So the formation of this friendship is the idea that that underlies these changes. Now, when studying networks, one can then extend that by looking at, for example, indirect friendships as well, um, but I won't go into that in too much detail here. Um, I want to focus on the results here. So. If you look at um, the pre-test here in June 2012, and then the post-test and the follow-up in 2016, and we look at these three measures just for exemplary uh, purposes, uh, what you see here is that we measured extended context of these indirect friendships, direct context of these direct friendships, and then intergroup anxiety. And interestingly, between the merger, so between pre-test and post-test, there were no significant effects between these variables. But after the merger, so uh, this was consistent across the different waves, uh, we saw that extended and direct contact predicted a decrease in anxiety. Now, most importantly, these results were, more, were stronger for the schools where there were more, uh, was a strong, uh, more balance in terms of ethnic diversity. So the schools that stayed segregated showed non-significant paths here. Now, what does this mean? This indicates that these kinds of contact processes might have underlied the, the changes that we found in the merged schools where there was a balance in terms of ethnic diversity, but not as much where there wasn't a balance because there were reduced contact possibilities introduced here. Okay, just to summarize and to quickly um, focus on the future. So what I wanted to illustrate here is one way in which we can use these interventions and social network processes and combine them to get a better idea of some of the causal processes that might have gone on, uh, underlie these changes that we found. Now, um, for future directions, it's important to focus on both social selection and influence. As I said before, these are two sides of the same coin and both need to be studied because both might find uh, be um, an explanatory process. Um, also, this can be applied in other kinds of areas such as personality development, antisocial behavior, and health development. Um, so, I'm currently working on uh, a, an intervention where this was done in terms of antisocial behavior, but I can easily imagine this to apply to other fields as well where social network processes are relevant. And finally, um, there are a couple of different uh, networks that one can study. So I just focused on friendships here, but um, as was also illustrated earlier in the, in the talk uh, by Jonas, uh, there are other kinds of networks that, occur, that you can study within an individual. And also you can look at other kinds of networks, such as physiological networks, so hormonal networks, and how these develop over time 
and how these changes explain uh, intervention uh, impact. Finally, um, of course, these different levels of analysis can also be com uh, combined in a multi-level framework. So I don't think these end uh, work independently from each other. Um, there's a couple of preliminary analysis that actually already do this. I'm working on this together with uh, Tom Snyders at Oxford University um, to enter this area where we look at multi-level applications. Um, so that's for the future and hope to be presenting on that very soon. Thank you.